Portions of the following program may contain pre recorded material. Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, candidate Hugh Hewitt. I am on my way back from Wyoming. I'll tell you about it tomorrow on the Thursday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. But Ed Morrissey is up from the great state of Texas sitting in today. He'll be able to fill you in on what he's been thinking and writing about over at Hot Air. And he's got quite a few thoughts. And I hope you've been reading Hot Air to see what he has been saying. Per usual, Ed is basically, I am mind melded with Ed and Ed is mind melded with me. It's the Catholic thing. Take it away, Ed Morrissey, and thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. I am Ed Morrissey, coming to you from the ReliefFactor.com studios here in Central Texas. And uh, Hugh and I are mind-melded. Our Catholicism mind-melds us, which leads me to our first major disclosure today. I am actually open-carrying a uh, assault, uh, high-capacity assault rosary. Um, a 3.16 caliber, as Dwayne put it earlier today. So, you know, just so that you know, full disclosure, carrying the, carrying the assault rosary, we're going to be talking about that with, um, with Catherine Jean Lopez and Dan McLaughlin later on in the show. We've actually got some great guests lined up, and I uh, hope you're going to be sticking with us for the whole, whole three hours. But, of course, the top story today is coming from Wyoming, where Liz Cheney is now Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant all rolled up into one for uh, losing a primary election. Um, wait a minute, let me check my notes on that. Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses Grant for losing a primary election. Dwayne! <laughs> These notes are terrible, Dwayne. <laughs> how's, how, is, how is Liz Cheney, Abraham Lincoln, and Ulysses S. Grant for losing a primary election? <laughs> well, as our friend Kurt Schlichter said on Twitter last night, after she compared herself to Grant, he said, well, at least Grant served. <laughs> Um, you know, it just, I, I think we talked about a little, uh, a little bit ago off air, which is that concession speech is largely a, a good example of why she lost. It really is. I mean, this is, and this is part of the, the sort of the Beltway Obsession, um, lecture series, I guess, that Liz Cheney has been on for the past year and a half. I mean, almost the entire term that she's been sort of focused on this, and it's because January 6th, of course took place at the very start of the term so i mean that that's part of what uh what this is what's going on here but this is a person who's clearly lost touch with wyoming she is fully invested in what's going on in the beltway and wyoming the, voters that got a chance to weigh in on it yeah the, yesterday the, the takeaway is is wyoming uh, uh voters don't care about the one six committee they want to know about inflation they want to know about you know the same issues that everybody else cares about and she doesn't seem to uh, give any voice to normal issues. There's only one issue with her, right. and they just got tired of it. Now they're gonna. I mean, certainly Liz Cheney painted it this way last night in her in her concession speech that you know she doesn't want to she doesn't want to stand down from fighting Donald Trump, and this was a a proxy battle between her and Donald Trump and Harriet Hageman, who's the uh, new presumed uh, representative from Wyoming because Republicans don't usually lose that seat. Um, it did align herself with Donald Trump, but she wasn't always a a uh, a Donald Trump uh, person. She's not a, a necessarily a knee jerk Donald Trump acolyte. You know, in 2016, she was part of the floor uh, effort, and this is something that, by the way, um, Eli Yokely uh, pointed out this morning, or uh, well, yeah, earlier this morning, um, Eli Yokely from Morning Consult Political uh, also had been at roll call. Uh, which was that she was part of the floor effort in 2016 to force a uh, to force a nomination vote that was strictly between Donald Trump and Ted Cruz in a last ditch effort to wrest the nomination away from Donald Trump. People may not remember this. This was a sort of a a rules committee fight in the uh, at the uh, Republican National Convention in 2016, but uh, but it did take place. And Hageman was part of that, so she's not exactly necessarily a, it, a full a full fledged acolyte of Donald Trump. But the thing but there is, you, that, but there you go, trying to bring up facts again. Fact, <laughs> facts are the last thing that this election was. Well, about. I mean, it's it, actually it is. It is about facts. It's about the fact that inflation is running high. It's about the fact that the Biden administration is imposing policies, especially in energy, but also land use policies, 
that are very damaging to Wyoming residents, and they're very unhappy about that. And they only got one person in the House to to fight for them, and that person is busy working for Nancy Pelosi. Yes, on the January sixth committee. I mean, this is not what this is not exactly political science. You know, six hundred here. When you are a House representative, you know you're going to be in front of your voters every two years, which means that you have to be responsive to your voters pretty much every day that you're in office in order to make sure that you secure your seat. And when you're not responsive to in fact, when you're entirely unresponsive to the issues that really matter to them, uh, and you're completely focused on political infighting in Washington, D.C., you're likely not to win your primary election. That's exactly what happened in Wyoming last night. Um, we sh- we should probably though give Liz Cheney a chance to offer her thoughts on this. Um, so let's go to um, cut number sixteen uh, and and listen to Liz Cheney explain why she did what she did. The great and original champion of our party, Abraham Lincoln, was defeated in elections for the Senate and the House before he won the most important election of all. Lincoln ultimately prevailed. He saved our union, and he defined our obligation as Americans for all of history. Speaking at Gettysburg of the great task remaining before us, Lincoln said that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. As we meet here tonight, that remains our greatest and most important task. Most of world history is a story of violent conflict, of servitude and suffering. Most people in most places have not lived in freedom. Our American freedom is a providential departure from history. We are the exception. We have been given the gift of freedom by God and our founding fathers. It has been said that the long arc of history bends toward justice and freedom. That's true, but only if we make it bend. Today, our highest duty is to bend the arc of history, to preserve our nation and its blessings, to ensure that freedom will not perish, to protect the very foundations of this constitutional republic. Um. I, you know the Ken Burns music is perfect here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, Ken Burns music playing underneath that um, concession speech of sorts. I'm not even sure you call it a concession speech. It's more of a valediction. I think is is what we're listening to. It was you no, know, it was the launch of. A, what did she say? Lincoln lost you know his his House and Senate seat before before winning you know the ultimate seat. She's she's signaling right out of the box that she's going to run for president. In what in what universe is she going to run for president? The, I mean, the I hate Trump universe. Well, I mean, even if, I mean, even if you concede the fact that you know, there's actually you know quite a few people who who might rally to that point, right? I mean, who's going to rally to Liz uh, Cheney on that issue? There are other politicians um, that aren't named Cheney. I mean, I'm not sure what she. I'm not sure what she thinks the brand of Cheney is in American politics. But it is. It is not uh, a, a a a rugged libertarian viewpoint. This is the Cheneys Just are pretty because... famously neocons that Democrats actually detest unless they can use them for their own purposes. That's exactly right. I mean, it, and I like and I like Dick Cheney. I, I adore the Cheney. I think I think he's. I think he's. A, I think he was a good vice president. Uh, like any like anybody else, I think he made some mistakes, um, but uh, I think he was overall a good vice president, smart guy, smart as a whip, been around forever, really knows his stuff, and simply put, he was the prince of darkness <laughs> in American politics, uh, popular American the politics. Fact that he's, for, the the for fact that years. the Cheney brand has now been redeemed in the eyes of all people left oh, of center, it's only, never oh, going to happen. Oh, yeah, it's it's, it's totally tra- say, it's only momentarily. Totally- it's only transactional when talking about Trump. That's right. the only time that they will tolerate the Cheneys. Right. And, and the New York Times, I think, was right. There's, this is the launch of a national campaign. She's She thinks that she's going to, uh, even if it's not a run for president, I think she's going to run a national campaign for, you know, truth, honor, and justice in politics, which would be great. 
if it's, you didn't have the baggage of the name Cheney on you, but instead of Lincoln and Grant, she should have she should have compared herself to Moses. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I, I what what I do, I'm compelled to do. I mean, that's that's what she's gonna do. She's, I, I think so. Yeah, I think that. I, well, don't put it don't put it past or anybody who got who gets a 38 point shellacking in a in a in a primary she did, election, she and then compares herself to to Lincoln and Grant in a Wyoming Republican primary. She didn't even get thirty percent of the vote. She did not get thirty percent of the vote. Well, we'll be back with the next chapter of Ken Burns's documentary in Wyoming <laughs> after a few commercial a, a few commercial spots that you didn't hear on NPR. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh Hewitt. We'll be right back. <laughs> Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Food for the Poor.
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh today. We've been telling you that thanks to donated food, every dollar donated provides four meals for hungry children who are refugees from the war in Ukraine. We've received many, many donations to Food for the Poor already, and you can join them by simply going to HughHewitt.com and clicking on the Help Ukraine banner. Some people have asked what kind of relief the Food for the Poor team and its ministry partners can deliver to active combat areas like Ukraine. This is Food for the Poor spokesman Todd Chapman. They're called mana packs, and they're uh, rice and beans and uh, protein uh, supplements of high nutritious. They're actually designed to provide healthy nutrition for malnourished kids. But we're packaging these up and sending them over in mass to Ukraine. And then we've got a distribution network of about 3,500 ministers of all different denominations. They're looking for these refugee families, usually moms and kids, and they're getting them this food because it's one of their greatest needs right now in, the, in, in Ukraine. So now it is your turn. You uh, Right now, please go to HughHewitt.com and make a tax-deductible donation by clicking on the big Send Food banner on Hugh's website. Your one-time gift in any amount will bless a hungry child at HughHewitt.com. Or if you prefer, you can also call with your gift at 855-359-4673. That's 855-359-HOPE to help our friends at the Christian Nonprofit Relief Organization, Food for the Poor. And getting back to Wyoming, we're going to talk a little bit about Wyoming here. I want to offer uh, a comment that's already kind of come up at hotair.com, which I think is actually pretty prescient, right? Um, someone called Former Lib um, writes, as long as Cheney gets 66 hours on national TV while Hageman gets 66 seconds, there will be more Cheneys. And I think that that's what you've got going on right now. I, you know, my my partner over there, um, Jazz Shaw, uh, who is you know Dwayne Patterson's favorite writer, um, writes that they're already starting the canonization of Liz Cheney on CNN. And 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 I, it, look, I mean, I think we're going to get a lot of that. I think that Lincoln and Grant thing is is going to be fairly powerful. Um, without them taking a look at the actual electoral map and realizing that, uh, you know, at least Lincoln won a couple of counties. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and Cheney did win two counties. She won uh, 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 Teton, which is where Jackson Hole's at. And uh, she also won Albany, which is uh, just next to the county uh, where Cheyenne's at. But that's it. I mean, it was pretty much a wipeout. And I, 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 believe that out of the 115,000 votes that were cast in Wyoming, there's not a you know, ton of people voting in Wyoming um, primaries. You know, she only got about 40,000 of those votes. I mean, it's it, it was not, or maybe not even 40,000. It, it was not close. It was not at all close. And, you know, we, we were hosting the um, uh, Decision Desk headquarters widget, so you can go over to hotair.com if you want to take a look at it. I'm sorry, she got 49,000 votes out of uh, sorry 170,000 cast. It was Harriet Hageman who got 113,000 votes on her own and got almost precisely two-thirds of the vote. And Liz Cheney got 29%, followed by you know uh, three other candidates who got less than 3% of the vote um, each and less than 5% put together. So this is not close. Um, this isn't even, I mean, if you're going to make a wartime analogy, this is, this is not even on the same battlefield. <laughs> it's, like, it's like showing up at the wrong spot. Uh, this, was, this was not a Ken Burns moment uh, for Liz Cheney. This was more of a, oh golly, I'm trying to even think of a good uh, political uh, parallel to this maybe jimmy carter's election in 1980 maybe maybe uh perhaps walter mondale's attempt to uh go after reagan in 1984 this was a bloodbath uh politically speaking not not literally speaking it was not the battle of the wilderness it was a political bloodbath and liz cheney i think her 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 aspirations to being lincoln and grant speak a lot as to just how disconnected she got from the reality of American politics, and especially the, the reality of, of American electoral politics, and voter contact, voter you know, voter con you know, constituent support. Clearly, Wyoming voters care about other things than Liz Cheney does. And this is what happens in American politics. When that happens, they send you packing and send somebody else who will take on the issues that they prioritize. 
Made that happen in the midterms as well. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com. We'll be right back. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by Birch Gold Group.
Welcome back. This is Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com filling in for you today, talking about Liz Cheney's Waterloo last night in uh, Wyoming. And I mean, this is sort of a it, it, it's 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 sort of a sad situation because Liz Cheney was somebody who had a lot of promise, who just simply I think got disconnected from her constituents because of something she clearly feels passionate about. I'm not going to say that she was doing this out of some sort of uh, sense of manipulation, but forgot that what matters is representing the voters that sent you to Washington, not representing yourself in Washington and at the expense of your at the expense of your constituents. And this is a lesson that sometimes people don't get to learn, right? There are some people who are more or less immune to primary challenges. They've been in Washington long enough. They're 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 sort of carbuncles and you you couldn't pry them out with, you know, three crowbars and and a milky and a milky way. But look, I mean in Wyoming, it's it's an unusual situation. First off, it's very conservative. Republicans are, uh, you know, clearly a a supermajority there. They only have one seat in the House, and so it's a statewide election every time you run. And so you can't just you can't just run on the basis of what people in Jackson Hole uh, think, and, and because it's or, or Cheyenne, because you you don't run on that type of constituency. You have to run a statewide race. So this makes it a little bit unique. Uh, what also makes it a little bit unique is that there were people who were trying to sort of do manipulations. I'm not going to say this was Liz Cheney. This came out of Bill Crystal's group, uh, the Accountability GOP Project, I believe it's called. And they tried running an ad that uh, they tried running this ad that made Hageman look uh, somewhat insane. So let's take a listen. It's a very brief clip. Clip number 15. Joe Biden is the largest or the most destructive human trafficker in our history. So this was the clip that they ran, right? You know, so this is one of those Zoom things, right, where you're right up on the camera. You kind of look, you kind of, it, it kind of looks a little, um, a little dodgy. But what she's talking about is the southern border. She's talking about the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of people crossing the southern border because of Joe Biden's border crisis, his refusal to secure the southern border, and. I mean, it could take decades for us to, to under <clears throat> fully understand the human trafficking that's going on at the southern border. You, you don't even need to t- take you don't even need to take decades. You take a look at what happened in um, near San Antonio. Oh yeah, this right. Like two or three weeks ago, right, where you had uh, somebody driving a eighteen wheeler that was packed with illegal immigrants who abandoned the truck in a heat wave that is in the you know three digits down here. Um, and those people literally cooked to death in that um, dozens, in that big rig. Right, dozens of them. That's that's human trafficking. That is, and, and it's and it's being enabled because Joe Biden, and Kamala Harris refused to secure the border, which is what Hageman's talking about, which is an issue that the House needs to take up. And so it is actually an issue that matters to people in Wyoming because it is an issue that the federal government is uh, failing on. So, and, so Bill Crystal's pack tries to make her look like a flaming crazy with that cut. And actually, when you look, even though they cherry picked it and micro cut that into, right. into six seconds, she's actually got a point. Well, she does have a point. And I mean, and part of the point is that she's focused on actual policy, Dwayne, right. which is something that Liz Cheney is entirely focused on Donald Trump and Hageman wisely decided that she was going to focus on policy and talk to Wyoming uh, voters about policy, but policies that matter. I mentioned this in the, in the first segment, but the big issues are how the Biden administration is cracking down on land use, who cracking down on energy production, uh, cracking down on farmers, uh, expanding the use of the Clean Water Act or Waters of the United States rule. Um, all stuff which... All which stuff which does is, damage it, to people in Wyoming. Not to mention inflation. Right? Not to mention just the fact that inflation is is roaring across the country, including in Wyoming. And that's what people in Wyoming care about. They care about inflation. They care. They care about all of these other policies that the Biden administration is putting into place because he's got a uh, a, a barely democratic House and a barely democratic Senate. But he's but he does have control of those, um, or at least the Democrats have control of those. And those are the issues that matter to Wyoming. And that's the reason why you have um, 
Liz Cheney losing by, th- what, 37, 38 points? Just, 37 points just last shy, night. Just shy of 40 points. Just shy of it 40 like points. Si- it was like 66 to 28. So, you know, we've, we've played Liz, we played Liz Cheney's um, uh, reaction to the loss already. Let's, let's take a listen to Harriet Hageman's uh, reaction to the win. I don't think we need to necessarily play Ken Burns underneath this, but, no. man, that was, that, was, that was fun. But, uh, no, this is Harriet Hageman talking to Laura Ingram last night on Fox News as to what she gets out of her election win last night. Well, again, I have not had a ch- an opportunity to even see or hear what she had to say because I've been kind of focused on what's going on here. It doesn't surprise me that she would revert to those same old talking points because that's really in large part what, her, what got her defeated. She's not focusing on Wyoming. She's not focusing on our issues. She's still focusing on an obsession about President Trump. And the citizens of Wyoming, the voters of Wyoming, sent a very loud message tonight. We have spoken, and that is not what we are interested in in terms of our lone congressional representative. Wyoming is entitled to have a representative that represents our interests, that listens to us, that addresses our issues. That isn't Liz Cheney, and the fact that that's where she went back to with her speech tonight, I think demonstrates that she really isn't listening to Wyoming now. She hasn't for quite some time, and that's why we needed to replace her. We need to have a representative in Wyoming who listens to us. You know, and I think that this is, again, this is part of the key when you're looking at this election, is that you can you can make it into oh well all Wyomingites are are MAGA hat wearing rubes, um, but th- they're the same people who elected Liz Cheney in the first place. And Liz Cheney clearly doesn't come from the MAGA wing of the party. Wyoming voters, by the way, tend to be a little bit more independent. They tend to be in the Cheney mold and sort of the rugged individualist mode. But what they want <laughs> is somebody representing their interests in Washington, and they're particular about that. Uh, they're not interested in. Uh, in beltway drama they're not interested in vendettas and i think that in in part the reason why voters probably were as sour on liz cheney as as it was is because they perceived this as as sort of a family fight you know donald trump went after uh went after dick cheney and george w bush during the 2016 election uh he continued doing so um angered a lot of people uh, about that, about the, but he blamed um, he blamed Dick Cheney for the war in Iraq. He blamed George W. Bush for the war in Iraq, uh, for for the uh, interventionist model of American foreign policy. It's something that Donald Trump explicitly ran against. And I think that there's a sense here among uh, among voters, uh, probably more acu- acutely felt in Wyoming, is that part of what Liz, is driving Liz Cheney is sort of like this family feud sort of thing. Is that the Cheneys don't like Trump? And that that is really what motivated her to join Nancy Pelosi's unprecedentedly partisan select committee investigation. I mean, this is an odd committee structure, even even if you remove all of the bias from it, it's an odd committee structure to only have two members of the opposing party on the committee because the Speaker of the House blocked the appointment of other members by their own party leader. I don't know that it's ever happened, that that has ever happened in uh, in House history. And it really has colored the view of what the January 6th committee has done. And in, 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 in not unfairly, part of the issue of credibility in the January 6th committee, which is what Liz Cheney was running on, she's basically running on the January 6th committee, and part of the issue of perception of this committee is that uh, it's it's unfairly biased that there aren't any checks on this committee that it, they are making mistakes because you don't have an adversarial format. I mean, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger are the only Republicans on this panel, and they are fully in with the Democrats on how they're approaching uh, witnesses and how they're approaching uh, the the narratives that they're building about uh, January sixth. There it, there are no dissenting opinions on this committee to balance out what's going on. It's the reason why you end up with uh, Cassidy Hutchinson and ending up with egg on her face and the committee ending up with egg on her face by having her give hearsay evidence to something she had no personal knowledge of and then having it turn out to be wrong. 
uh, which blew up her credibility, blew up the credibility of the January 6th committee. Had you had Jim Jordan on that panel, that, that testimony never would have taken place. He would have challenged it on the basis of just normal hearsay. Is that If you want to have a testif- testimony as to what happened in a presidential limo, then bring in people who were in the presidential limo to, to do it. Don't say, I heard it from a friend who heard it from a friend who heard it from a friend. And that's that was Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony in that in that instance. And it's that was a microcosm of what's wrong with this committee. And I think that the, I think Congress has every right to investigate January 6th. They were the victims. Right. It was aimed at them. Uh, it interrupted their constitutional process of counting the Electoral College votes. And, and of course, Congress can investigate almost anything at once. But this is particularly within its wheelhouse. Uh, but you have to do it in a manner that's credible. You have to do it in a manner that lends weight to the to the results. And Liz Cheney is participating in a process that doesn't have credibility, that is not lending weight to this. And so if you're going to run on that, especially in a state where uh, people are already inclined to think that maybe this is uh, a bit personal rather than rather than you know, a justice-minded effort, then be prepared to have people weigh in on the credibility of what it is that you're running on. And clearly, in Wyoming, <laughs> nobody's buying, or very few people, 20, 29%, a whopping 29% of Wyoming voters are buying what Liz Cheney's selling. And that's why we have elections. Hageman ran on the issues. Liz Cheney ran on her record. Liz Cheney lost. When we come back, though, I want to talk a little bit about what Hageman said and why that might matter in 2024, and I think it will matter in 2024. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Ed's going to be right back. But I want to take this moment and remind you that Birch Gold is in the field waiting for you to contact them about buying gold. I always buy my gold from Birch Gold. I always buy it in Canadian Maple Leaves or Kruger Ends or American Eagles, whatever they have the most of. It doesn't affect the supply. The reason I buy those coins from Birch Gold is because they are one ounce of gold. You can check the spot market. They add a little markup. They just send them to you. You send the money first. That's the way the gold market works. Or you can open a physical precious metals depository with Birch Gold. They are a third-party custodian of Roth IRAs and 401ks, and they are recognized as such and respected by the IRS, which is getting much bigger, as we've been talking about for two weeks. But if they look and see that your gold IRA is a physical gold IRA and it's administered by our friends at Birch Gold, they leave you alone. They know it's absolutely legit. Uh, You can't do that with a shoebox. You can't do it with sketchy folks. You got to do it with a recognized depository. And that's what Birch Gold is. They buy your gold, they put it in the depository and they maintain it until your retirement when you take it out. Gold at 1800, it's a signal to many people to get in there and buy it. So HughGold.com, HughGold.com or text Hugh to 989898. Please don't forget as well. Our friends at relieffactor.com. I took it to Jackson Hole with me. It's flying back with me because, of course, small airplanes are big airplanes. Big airports are little airports. Travel is always the time that people pull stuff, strain stuff, sit too long in one position, have their neck go bad. I cannot wait to get back to to Dr. Meg because... uh, been eight days and now my neck feels like it did before I started traction. But relieffactor.com has kept my knees and my ankles and everything else fine. I take it every single day and I hope you do as well. It costs nineteen ninety five to get started. Don't wait around. Ed Morrissey probably uh, got it down in Texas. I don't know. Ask him when he comes back. But he should be taking relieffactor.com every single day. Relieffactor.com. Go nowhere America. Ed Morrissey coming right back on this Wednesday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by The Wild Adventure. Learn more at TWA.us.
Welcome back, everyone. This is Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh from the ReliefFactor.com studios here in Central Texas. Few thoughts here as we wrap up the news out of Wyoming. Harriet Hageman has defeated Liz Cheney handily in the Republican primary for the at-large House seat in Wyoming. Uh, roughly 66-29 is the is the current count 99 percent of precincts reporting so that's not going to change much uh by the way there were primaries last night in, in alaska too and we're going to bring you the breaking results of that probably sometime around september 5th um <laughs> you're gonna have to wait for a lot of other things to happen in alaska they've got mail-in ballots that they haven't processed they've got the multi-choice ranked choice voting system up there uh the open primary system it's a mess in Alaska, and you know Alaska's election system is you know is is the one that you use when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight, but you're not going to get it for another three weeks. Um, so I'd like to say that we can we can talk with firmness about the Alaska results. About the only thing that we can say is that Lisa Murkowski and Kelly Shabaka are going to face off against each other in the Senate race because nobody else even came within miles of those two. Uh, and at least at the moment, Lisa Murkowski is leading slightly. Uh, but I would say wait until after all of the mail-in votes are counted. Uh, I'm not even sure that we have solid information on Sarah Palin's uh, run for the House seat uh, for Alaska. So, again, we're not going to really know much about Alaska for at least another week or two. The Hageman, Hageman's comments, though, with um, Laura Ingram reminded me of something that I've been saying for quite some time. I mean, this is an interesting result in terms of Cheney's opposition to you know, Donald Trump, Hageman's embrace, belated or not, of Donald Trump, which was obviously part of this uh, primary fight. But Hageman's comments about what voters are concerned about when they go to the ballot box, I think is really telling about what's going to happen in the 2024 Republican presidential cycle because she's right. Voters don't like to look back. And Liz Cheney is asking them to keep looking back to November, to November 2020 and January 2021. And that's not where people live. People don't live in the past. People live in the present where inflation's 8.5% year on year, where the Biden administration is trying to restrict land use uh, through all sorts of bureaucratic red tape and, um, and, and hostile policies uh, to the voters in Wyoming. Th those are the things they have to worry about now. And so when we get past this midterm cycle, Hageman's clearly going to win this seat. I, I mean, this, is, this isn't even going to be close. The Republican who gets nominated is the Republican who gets elected. And while some groups might come in and still try to play the Hageman's crazy card, uh, it, it's clear, it, it clearly didn't sell with Republicans in Wyoming. That's really all that matters when it comes to the general election. Uh, but after the midterm is over, I think that Republicans are going to ask themselves the same question that Hageman is posing here, or not question, but the same answer that Hageman is posing here as an as a explanation of what happened last night, which is, are voters going to be focused on what happened in November 2020, or are they going to be focused on what's happening in their lives in the uh, winter and spring of 2024 when they go to the polls to select the next nominee for um, president for the GOP. And I think if you look at this, if you look at what happened in Wyoming, I think the answer is they're going to be more focused on the present and the immediate future than they will be on the past. And I think this is one of the reasons why Donald Trump may need to may may even be thinking twice about running for president. Right now, he's very, all of his messaging is about the past, about stolen elections. Uh, you know, the raid on Mar-a-Lago last week was clearly a, um, a watershed moment. It almost begs him to get into the race, which raises all sorts of other questions that we don't need to get into right at the moment. But I think that that's a momentary impact. I think that the, I think that this thread that Hageman is tugging on here uh, in her interview last night with Laura Ingram, and something that Laura Ingram herself has mentioned in the context of the 2024 primary fight, is what are we going to focus on? Are we going to focus on, are we going to run an election on what happened four years earlier? Because that's not where voters are at. Voters are at 
the the present day disaster of the Biden administration and its economic and energy policies, and for that matter, to a certain extent, its foreign policy decisions, especially when it comes to Afghanistan. Uh, and that's what they're going to be voting on. That's what they're going to be interested in. So I think that if you're looking at this result in Wyoming and saying, well, look, I mean, Donald Trump backed Hagman, so this is a good sign for Donald Trump. Yeah, in the moment it might be. But A, I don't think that this was really about, I don't think Donald Trump's endorsement was about Donald, it was about Hageman. It was about, it was about getting even with Liz Cheney, and I think everybody understands that. But B, I just don't think that this election was really about the past. I think Hageman's right. If it was about the past, it would, it would have looked different. It, I, I don't know that Liz Cheney would have won it, but she probably would have come uh, somewhat closer than 39 points out or 37 points out. This is about voters sending a message to Republicans that they are interested in present and future, not the past. And I think that once we get past the midterms, that's a lesson that's going to apply in 2024 as well. So stay tuned to that. Stay tuned for more. We've got a great show still coming up. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh. We'll be right back. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Food for the Poor.
Portions of the following program may contain pre recorded material. Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. It's Hugh Hewitt. I am on my way back from Wyoming. I'll tell you about it tomorrow on the Thursday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. But Ed Morrissey is up from the great state of Texas sitting in today. He'll be able to fill you in on what he's been thinking and writing about over at Hot Air. And he's got quite a few thoughts. And I hope you've been reading Hot Air to see what he has been saying. Per usual, Ed is basically, I am mind melded with Ed and Ed is mind melded with me. It's the Catholic thing. Take it away, Ed Morrissey, and thank you. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for you today from the ReliefFactor.com studios here in Central Texas. And the Catholic thing is indeed what we're going to be talking about with our next guest, uh, my friend Catherine Jean Lopez. And Catherine Jean, I certainly hope that you have your rosary out. I have my, I have my assault grade, high capacity, 59 bead um, cylinder. Um, rosary in my hand as I speak, as I'm sure you do as well. Well, you know, the amazing thing about that Atlantic piece, Ed, is that the rosary is the best weapon we have, you know, to combat evil. Um, prayer, prayer is real. It's action. And so inadvertently, <laughs> the, uh, the author of that Atlantic piece uh, caught on to something I do have to say, though, there there is something that very much worries me about this. As, as someone who prays the rosary outside of Planned Parenthood in Manhattan um, yeah. uh, regular, regularly, um, one, one thing I noticed, so the, the first Saturday of every month, um, there there is a witness for life outside Planned Parenthood in Manhattan. And uh, this, for the first time, I saw signs that said, don't pray here, pray inside. You know, usually it's like God loves abortion and things like this. Right. But we see in Ireland right now, they're trying to make it illegal to pray outside of an abortion clinic. Um, there, There's, you know, there. there Again, inadvertently, um, I, I think people realize it actually is a threat. Well, and, well, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, and I think, I, and, and, and by the way, I should make sure that I introduce you properly as a National Review contributor, nationalreview.com, and, uh, and, and certainly somebody I have enjoyed talking about, uh, talking with about politics and, and certainly about um, faith. You know, and I, I kind of like joke. Two decades now, Ed. I know, I know, exactly. Yeah, we go back. Uh, we go back. We go way back, and um, and and I'm very blessed that we go way back. But I, I, I you know, I wrote this response to the Atlantic piece, and you know, I was, I was alternating between high dudgeon and you know, sort of low comedy because this is, on one level, such a ridiculous attack on what is a very gentle and contemplative um, prayer process. Um, and, you know, I've been joking around about carrying in a, you know, um, a high-capacity assault rosary ever, ever since that piece appeared at the Atlantic. But, you know, I'll be honest with you, I'm a dilettante on the rosary. <laughs> I really am. I mean, my wife is the prayer warrior, right? So, I, you know, I've been, we've been teasing each other about how she's a concealed carry, uh, you know, a concealed <laughs> rosary carrier. Uh, but she's really the uh, she's really the prayer warrior, and she has done exactly what you are talking about: prayed the rosary outside of abortion clinics. And and I think that you're right about this, and and that there is a more malicious intent here to radicalize people against the rosary. And we can talk about that on a temporal level. We can also talk about that on a spiritual level. But on the temporal level, I think it is to try to marginalize people uh, of faith who are acting on that faith in public, and especially in, yeah. in, in terms of opposing policies that the left is, you know, I mean, sacramentalized. I mean, this, Daniel Paniton's talking about, well, you know, they're sacram sacramentalizing guns. I've never heard anybody sacramentalize guns, but Democrats have sacramentalized abortion. And, and that is, I think, really what this is about. I think you put your finger right on it. Yeah, and unfortunately, we have seen in recent years attacks on religious freedom where you're only supposed to be in a place of worship, right? Right. Um, there's, there's a danger, and, and they're right, you know? There's a danger to living 
faith out in the world, you know. That's what we're supposed to do. And, um, and it, it is, it is, you know, a threat to, to evil and abortion is evil, you know. And, um, and the more we see just attacks on reality, it's not a surprise that, that, uh, you know, this supernatural weapon would be, would be seen as a threat. And, but I love what you said, Ed, about the, the tenderness of this, you know. I mean, the rosary is a prayer that the Mother of God leads us on, meditating on the life of Christ. And there can be nothing so grounding as that, you know. Right. And so, yeah, no, I... I my my prayer is that that uh, this attack leads to more people praying the rosary, more people understanding what it is. Um, you know, this could be a blessing in disguise. It could be. And, and, and again, we're speaking with Catherine Jean Lopez, NationalReview.com contributor, and talking about this article in The Atlantic, which, you know, The Atlantic has just become sort of the depository of garbage hot takes anyway. But this one, this one was really something. I mean... No, it was, it was a surprise. <laughs> it was a I surprise, yeah. I mean, and it was right after, two days after, the same magazine ran another hot take that... The issue with Jane's Revenge uh, targeting um, targeting pro-life facilities for terrorist attacks, which w- were, was literally happening, they were literally taking credit for, was actually secondary to the fact that Republicans were were, were pouncing on that to uh, you know for political gain. And I mean, it, it just the the cognitive yes, dissonance between these two articles. Be be offended by attacks on. Centers that literally help women, you know? Right. Um, which, honestly, we should all be able to get behind, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, no. I, well, and the other amazing thing about the Atlantic Peace on the Rosary was it came out on the Feast of the Assumption. It was yes. the greatest Marian feast day. Yeah, I actually had missed that, and a number of people pointed it out to me. It was like, well, I'm not going to go back and add that in, but you're right. It's it's really an interesting it's really an interesting juxtaposition. I'm sure that no one at the Atlantic knew that knew about the feast day. I I, I am absolutely convinced well, that well, nobody there knows enough about Catholicism to know that. Yeah, no, considering they thought the Rosary was one of the seven sacraments, right? That's, that's probably safe to assume. If if you don't know the difference between a sacrament and a sacramental, maybe you shouldn't be commenting on this particular thing. But you know, I mean, the the other thing too, and you know, I may not be the best at praying the rosary, but it's a, it's a beautiful prayer. Normally, when Catholics get criticized for it, it's because the, uh, you know outside critics will will say it's too focused on the feminine, right? And and you have the Atlantic arguing that it's a you know a, 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 a masculine warrior based prayer mm. um, tradition, and I'm thinking. Uh, maybe the prayer to Saint Michael the Archangel is what you is what you're talking about, not the Rosary. I mean, this really yeah. is. It's such a gentle, it's such a gentle meditative prayer that it just seems um, astonishing that anybody would single it out for that for uh, uh, for criticism as being extremist. And and uh, I'll let you I'll let you take it from there. Well, in so many ways, though, it doesn't surprise me. I remember one morning standing outside of Planned Parenthood in, in Manhattan, and I, I had my rosary in my hand, and a woman came by and said, put it away! Like, that's how she sounded. And I, I thought, of all the things that are happening in Manhattan right now, this is the, <laughs> this is right. the greatest threat, really? But maybe it is, you know? Um, I, I, I just think that Atlantic Peace is such a reminder to us that, that prayer is actually powerful and uh, that, that, that someone would see it as such a threat to write that piece um, should be a reminder to us that we better be praying the rosary every day, you know? Indeed, indeed. And, and it should be a reminder to us that uh, people who are activists are looking for any symbology that they can apply to uh, to their opponents and to radicalize it and, and make it extreme and and, and demagogue on it uh, in order to silence them, Catherine Jean. And I think that that's really the, the, the big lesson here. Is, and I think that's exactly what The Atlantic was trying to do here.
Yeah, that that is definitely my fear. The the one one thing I'll say though to pro lifers to to just to, just to be cautious of is I I feel this every every time I'm in front of Planned Parenthood in in, in New York, people think we're judging them. Don't yep. don't have that that kind of attitude. Be gentle, like the rosary is. Like the rosary is. Catherine Jean Lopez, NationalReview.com. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Ed Morrissey, filling in for Hugh Hewitt. We'll be right back. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Food for the Poor.
Turning the beat around here at the Hugh Hewitt Show. Disco lives. It's better than the Ken Burns stuff, right? <laughs> I love the Ken Burns stuff. That was great. Um, filling in here at the ReliefFactor.com studios here in Central Texas for Hugh Hewitt. Got to give you a quick update on the whole Ken Burns thing. Um, on the Today Show, Hallie Jackson, NBC News reporter, Hallie Jackson reports just a couple minutes ago on Twitter. On the Today Show, Congresswoman Liz Cheney tells Savannah Guthrie that she is, quote, thinking, end quote, about running for president in 2024, but makes it clear she's made no decision yet. Yeah, that whole thing about Lincoln and Grant and, you know, continuing the fight, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> I'm just saying, I think it's pretty clear that uh, what she has in mind. Um, now, she may have discovered that it's not realistic, but clearly it's what she has in mind. Uh, let's turn to something a little bit more uplifting, which is the effort for food for the poor. We've been telling you that thanks to donated food, every dollar donated provides four meals for hungry children who are refugees from the war in Ukraine. We've received many, many donations already, and you can join them by simply going to HughHewitt.com and clicking on the Help Ukraine banner. Some people have asked what kind of relief Food for the Poor, the Food for the Poor team and its ministry partners can deliver to active combat areas like Ukraine. This is Food for the Poor spokesman Todd Chapman. They're called mana packs, and they're uh, rice and beans and uh, protein uh, supplements with high nutritious. They're actually designed to provide healthy nutrition for malnourished kids. But we're packaging these up and sending them over in mass to Ukraine. And then we've got a distribution network of about 3,500 ministers of all different denominations. They're looking for these refugee families, usually moms and kids, and they're getting them this food because it's one of their greatest needs right now in, the, in, in Ukraine. So now it's your turn. Right now, please go to HughHewitt.com and make a tax-deductible donation by clicking on the big Send Food banner on Hugh's website. Your one-time gift in any amount will bless a hungry child at HughHewitt.com, or if you prefer, you can also call with your gift, 855-359-4673. That's 855-359-HOPE. To help our friends at the Christian nonprofit relief organization, Food for the Poor. Again, go to the HughHewitt.com website, click on the Food for the Poor banner, um, and uh, uh, make sure that you, uh, excuse me, on the Help Ukraine banner, let me sure make sure I got that right, on the Help Ukraine banner, and make sure that you make your uh, tax-deductible donation right there. You're going to help a whole lot of people out with that. Back to the Liz Cheney thing, because we're going we're gonna to move on to other topics here. Uh, uh, for the rest of the show, probably most of the rest of the show, will be talking about other topics. Might come back to it in the third hour with Jim Garrity when he drops by to discuss what the political implications are. And um, but we're going to get back to a couple of other topics here in this hour. But I, I mean, it's fine. I mean, Liz Cheney clearly is not representing the constituency of Wyoming because the constituency of Wyoming just declared that it, that she wasn't representing them. So she's going to be doing something with her time. It's Still clearly not going to be focusing on Wyoming's issues with inflation, with um, with land use, with water use, with um, overregulation in energy markets, that sort of thing, which are the issues that Wyoming residents care about. She wants to run for president because she wants to focus on what her top issue is, and her top issue is Donald Trump. And look, I mean, I think that, you know, it's a free country, at least for the moment. It's still a free country, and you can do whatever you want if she wants to run for president on that basis. Uh, that's fine, but it's already difficult enough for a House um, member to run for president, even with the cooperation of a political party. The last time that actually happened successfully was James Garfield back in, I believe it was the 1880 election. You don't run for president from the House because, generally speaking, you don't have a large enough constituency to lift you up. Um, and while Liz Cheney was winning statewide elections in Wyoming, uh, she clearly lost this one and lost it big. And so there's not a whole lot to uh, recommend her for, uh, uh, for serious consideration as a presidential challenger, uh, with the exception of the, the one constituency that she has been dutifully serving on a very consistent basis for the last several months, and that's the media constituency. You're going to see a lot of her service to the media constituency over the next couple of days at least, and then I think she's going to find that that constituency isn't really hers either, to her chagrin. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh Hewitt. We'll be right back.
If you become a member of the universe, you not only get every previous Hugh Hewitt show, you get the after show, the best podcast you've never heard. www.huniverse.com
Welcome back, everyone. This is Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh Hewitt, where disco lives forever, from the ReliefFactor.com studios here in Central Texas. Joining us now is Dan McLaughlin from uh, from National Review Online, NationalReview.com, senior writer there. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of issues with Dan. First off, uh, Dan, I, I read with great interest your your piece on the Atlantic's uh, juxtaposition of their rosaries are extremist um, piece, along with the uh, Republicans pounce on an actual terrorist group, <laughs> and that's a bad thing piece, uh, within literally two days of each other, Dan. That was, uh, it's a great piece that you have up, brief and um, brief and devastating. What do you make of what's become of the Atlantic over the last year or so? Thanks. Uh, glad to be here, Ed. Uh, yeah, it's it's really it's really nuts. It's um, you know I think what you have is I mean first of all the Atlantic, which which again like a lot of these legacy outlets, it does still produce a good deal of good content. Right. But there's this kind of creeping paranoia there that um, you know and clickbait, I guess. But you know they have to constantly build up threats uh, from the right. Uh, you know, I mean, we remember the famous uh, headline where they, they referred to um, reopening uh, uh, the state of Georgia uh, early on in the, uh, the the COVID pandemic as Georgia's experiment in human sacrifice. Yes. Um, so this is this is in the same vein as that, right? So they, on the one hand, they have to stretch and say, um, you know, that this there's this piece extremist gun culture co opted the rosary, and so they're they're trying to paint, you know, some. Uh, basically some, you know, some of sort of your, your typical, just very online yahoos. Um, some of whom may be dangerous, some of whom may not be. Uh, but, you know, they're no different than any other kind of nutty corner of the internet, you know, using the imagery of the rosary beads along with, you know, guns. Right. Uh, and they're like, oh, this is, you know, it, it, this, how this is. Um, they're bringing a sacrament of their own to the the AR-15 sacred object movement, which, first of all, if you know any Catholics who are listening, will be chortling at the concept of the rosary as a sacrament, right? Uh, and that it's kind of shocking that nobody at the nobody at the magazine picked that up. You would think you don't even need a Catholic; you just need like some ex-Catholic, somebody who made it through like the third grade, who could tell you there are seven sacraments. This ain't one of them. <laughs> uh, but at the same time. They're, 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 you know, they do this piece on uh, the Jane's Revenge group that has carried out, like, actual firebombings. Like, these are actual terrorists. Uh, and probably if they keep this up sooner or later, they will kill somebody. Right. Uh, we know that from the history of groups that, that tried to do bombings, um, you know, property bombings. Sooner or later, that, that, that goes further. Think of the weathermen. Um, exactly. So, you know... But but when they're discussing Jane's revenge, their angle is all like Republicans pounce, right? It's it, the right's new bogeymen, right wing activists and politicians are eating it up. Well, maybe the problem is the people doing the fire bombings, not the people <laughs> getting worried about it. But you it, think you know they see they 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 they're, they're incapable of having a symmetrical response to threats, right? So right. So the mere imagery of the rosary with the gun to them is is terrifying whereas the actual reality of fire bombings is not well you know dan i i I think that there's something to that i think there's more to it though than that in a couple directions one is that it's just downright sloppy to say well somebody who has got thousands of followers is somehow is, is somehow got more impact on the on the imagery of the rosary than hundreds of millions of catholics who use it every single day around the world is is laughable to anybody who's got uh, you know, thousands of followers themselves on social media. You don't even have to be Catholic to understand that that's a really dumb argument, right? I've got 63,000 um, followers on Twitter, and I'm pretty sure that I have not made Die Hard not a Christmas movie. I mean, I'm not going to concede that it is, but I'm just saying that, that my, my, my years-long campaign against that idea is not exactly successful, Dan. <laughs> And uh, regardless of how many thousands of followers I have, again, we're talking with Dan McLaughlin, senior writer at NationalReview.com. So on one hand, it's just sloppy, but I think the other part of this is that they're setting this up to to sort of box in people 
by taking their normal everyday symbology and making it toxic and uh, you know especially when it comes to religion because the left feels threatened by people of faith and and i think that there's more to this than just um a a, a stupid analyst and a, a completely ignorant editorial staff i think that there's something a little bit more intentional and malicious about this yeah, and it, it is part of the overall trend that, um, you know, that I think is going to drive uh, our politics to be divided along religious lines more yep. and more in the future, uh, which, frankly, you know, look, I think I think the left's happy place, um, what has worked for them politically, um, is to have politics divided along racial lines. I think division along religious lines uh, which is unhealthy in its own way, um, but is probably less of a winning political division for them. Well, I think you're right about that. I think that that's a real losing proposition, and um, and, and I guess we'll see. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. I do want to get to another piece that you wrote at National Review uh, about what's going on in the Manhattan DA's office with Alan Weisselberg, because you and I took a look at the news that the New York Times broke, I would say, was it um, yesterday afternoon, or was it the night before the New York Times broke the news that Alan Weisselberg, who's, of course, the the long time, I guess he's a CFO of Trump organization. He's the, he's the top ranking money guy in the yeah. um, organization is going to cut a deal, which is going to land him less than a hundred days in jail all told, but he's not going to provide any evidence against Donald Trump. So to me, normally a plea deal with a, with a figure like Weisselberg would normally signal that the prosecutor's case is really starting to develop. In this case, it looks like the prosecutors are just really throwing in the towel and want to get, want to get this thing over with and, and, and get it off their plate. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, my colleague Andy McCarthy, who, who, who is an ex-prosecutor, talks about this with, you know, has talked about the same kind of trend that, that you've seen sometimes with the, you know, the Mueller investigation and the, right. uh, the Durham investigation as well. But, like, typically, if you're, if, you're, if you're rolling up comparatively minor figures in an investigation uh, and they're not pleading guilty to, uh, you know, a conspiracy or something, if they're not pleading in a way that, that obviously indicates that they're testifying against and pointing the finger at somebody else, that probably means the investigation's losing momentum rather than gaining it. And I think it's clear that, you know, the special prosecutors and the other senior people who are already assigned to this case have been, uh, you know, resigned or reassigned. So I think it, it, it seems pretty clear that Bragg is just, Alvin Bragg, the DA there, is just closing up shop uh, and, and saying, you know, look, I've poured enough money and manpower into investigating Donald Trump and, and I'm done. Well, and as I mean, first off, I would encourage people to go to nationalreview.com and read Dan McLaughlin's analysis of this because you delve deeply into this and talk about why this case was probably a loser from the get-go, which was that the types of things that they wanted to prove weren't really crimes. They may be, they may not be great business practices. They may be, there may be some ethics, uh, some ethic, uh, ethical issues involved but they're not really crimes and that was part of what the problem with this case was under cyrus vance and now that alvin bragg's in office i think kind of surprisingly alvin bragg may have decided that this was not a great way to to kick off his career as a (laughs) as a manhattan da yeah and i mean look bragg is on the one hand a progressive who obviously you know loathes trump and his base loathes trump but on the other hand he is one of the sort of classic progressive prosecutor types who sees things from a defense perspective more than your typical prosecutor does. Um, and I think, I think he didn't want to shoot at Trump and miss, uh, and right. he didn't want to waste a ton of his resources on this. So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, they, they, the original theory, they were going to say, well, you know, they looked into the Trump organization's finances, which presumably included a lot of kind of puffery of exactly how much Trump's properties were worth. But Trump doesn't have, you know, it's a private company. He doesn't have shareholders. Right. Uh, the, the banks that loaned him money got paid back. So where's, who, who, where's the harm here? Who's the victim? Uh, and the closest they could ever come up with was, well, you kind of cheated the tax man. Yeah, not necessarily something that a jury, even in Manhattan, will probably care a lot about. I, and, and look, I mean, I think that that's, you'd have to have a pretty bulletproof case to put that 
in front of a jury. And uh, clearly they weren't getting it from Alan Weisselberg, and I'm not sure who else they would have been able to get it from. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think it's important to stress here that the issue here was the tax treatment of Weisselberg's own compensation. So right. it was not, you know, they were not able to prove sort of a major tax evasion case on, on the part of the organization. Uh, the issue was specifically just with the kind of thing that it was, e- it was easy to imagine that Trump would have just left this to Weisselberg. So, I mean, this is interesting in the context of what's been going on over the last week or so with Donald Trump, too. I mean, you talk about Alvin Bragg was was cautious about um, having to do a swing and a miss against Trump. I mean, we can also talk about the raid here, and that, that same risk was taken by um, Merrick Garland. We've got about 30 seconds. I'll just let you uh, I'll let you um, uh, respond to this really quickly, Dan McLaughlin. I mean, that's that's the risk that Garland ran here, too, with the raid, right? Yeah, and, and look, at the end of the day, both Trump and the people pursuing him have existed over and over again in this gray area where the law doesn't quite reach Trump, but it doesn't quite put him in the clear. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're on uncharted ground time and time again. Dan McLaughlin, senior writer at NationalReview.com. You can find him on Twitter, at Baseball Crank, by the way. He's a great Twitter follower. You should follow him on Twitter, at Baseball Crank. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com. We'll be right back. Hi, it's Hugh Hewitt. Don't go anywhere. Ed Morrissey is sitting in for me, but I do want to remind you that many of you are getting back into the housing market after a, uh, ah, we can't afford it, three-month pause. And that's good because the uh, Fed has gotten rates back to where they need to be to stop inflation. But so much money has come into the country that the 10-year is back below 3%. When I left Maine for Wyoming, it was at 2.88%. Andrew and Todd are back doing like box office business. The reason being, of course, is that many of you know you can't stay in a rent. You just cannot stay in a rental, especially moms and dads who have long ago bought their house, but now they've got 20-somethings and 30-somethings who are living in rentals and getting rent increased, whatever the release allows. They know they got to get them up. Become a non-occupying co-borrower with your son or daughter, your grandson or your granddaughter. Your credit is great. Their credit is beginning to look good, but it's going to take them a few more years. You might add to the down payment, but you go on the deed with them. You go on the loan with them. Your credit helps their credit, and everybody wins, and they get out of the rental market. Go and call andrewandtodd.com at 888-888-1172. There was Sierra Pacific Mortgage. They lend you the money, and if you're a senior citizen, they're the ones to call if you need a reverse loan. That means you just get the cash out of your house, never make a mortgage payment again. But you start at 888 or you go to andrewandtodd.com. Don't forget, though, relieffactor.com. I don't want you to forget to take it. I took it with me to Wyoming. I take it for a reason. You know, people try and pull tricks on me, even when I'm interviewing future Congress people. Uh, hey, have you got your relief factor with you? And I've always got it in my, my sport coat. And I take it everywhere I go because I don't want to miss a day and I don't want to fall behind. It's it's been a week since I've been out on the hilly, rolly beach to Beacon 10K, and I don't know if I'm going to have a chance to run in Wyoming. I don't know. If cattle are out there in the streets. I don't know. Uh, but ReliefFactor.com went with me anyway, and it ought to go with you wherever you go. 1995 is the starter pack. I hector you every day to remember to take it. ReliefFactor.com, 1995, the only place you can get it. ReliefFactor.com. Ed Morrissey coming right back after this. Stay tuned. The Hugh Hewitt Show is now available on TV. Go to SalemNewsChannel.com or download the app. You can also watch on Roku and Fire Stick. Salem News Channel, the antidote to the mainstream media.
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com from the ReliefFactor.com studios in Central Texas. Joining us now is Brian Westbury, Senior, senior Economist, First Trust Portfolios, at Westbury on Twitter. Uh, Brian, great to talk to you today. I want to ask you about uh, this Inflation Reduction Act um, that Joe Biden signed last night, and now Democrats are describing as anything but an Inflation Reduction Act. What can we expect uh, out of this bill? Because clearly inflation re- reduction isn't one of them. <laughs> yeah, Ed, Ed, it is great to be with you, and you are, uh, you are absolutely right. And, and I, what I don't get is why they still keep calling it this, because I, 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 I I have finally decided that politicians just think everybody is stupid. Like, like right. they're going to keep saying it over and over again as if you can look me in the eye and tell me red is blue and I'm going to believe you. And, uh, and so this is obviously will not raise uh, a lower inflation at all. Uh, what it, I, I, in one way, I, I look at uh, th- this bill and and I and I count my lucky stars, right? Because they wanted to push the ta- the, the individual tax rate up to thirty nine point six, the capital gains tax rate uh, that high, uh, uh, corporate taxes to twenty eight. They wanted to tax uh, uh, carried interest uh, and uh, uh, a step up basis uh, after you died. Uh, uh, for your uh, inheritance, and so, so, so the bottom line is, we, we, we this is uh, build back better, light, light, double light, right? And and so, so that's good. But on the other, on the other side, it, it's just more growth in government. It's just not as much as they wanted. And when you have a bigger government, uh, you end up with slower growth in productivity and entrepreneurship, and that leads to more inflation in the long run than you would have had otherwise. Well, not just more inflation, but slower growth, right? I mean, we kind of went through this in 2009 with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, right? Uh, Where there was this massive 800 and something billion dollar um, stimulus package that was passed in order to uh, help write the economy at the same time that the Obama administration was putting in place all sorts of different um, anti-growth policies, including on energy right. production, by the way, as well. And what ended up, the only reason why we end up coming out of that is because the Fed went on a monetary expansion binge for several years in order to make money cheap enough so that you could get enough capital investment to keep the economy going. And we're paying for that now. That's part of the structural um, uh, the, it's part of the infrastructure, if you will, of the inflationary wave that we've got right now. And it's the reason why the Fed is starting to act quickly to tamp it down is because they need to get all of that excess monetary supply out of the system uh, if they can. But um, so now we've got the worst of the, the both worlds in 2009. You've got the Fed cracking down on monetary supply and you've got government spending and expanded uh, regulation. So even apart from the inflation question, what you're talking about here is probably not just slow growth, but no growth and, and possibly uh, spending our way into a recession here. Yeah. I, I mean, I believe, I do believe we will see a recession in 2023. Uh, uh, probably may, uh, maybe it, it, uh, we make it all the way to 2024, although I don't think so. Uh, and it's and a lot of it's because of exactly what you just described. It is going to be a stagflationary type of uh, recessionary period right. of time. That is a slow growth with higher inflation. And then what you got to we have to see what happens because politicians in D.C. a recession comes, uh, and and don't kid yourself. The Fed, it, our politics, you know, Jerome Powell is a politician. That's you know he. He's got to convince everybody that he can do this, but but if a recession comes, he, he he's going to end up cutting rates, and then you don't get rid of inflation, and that's exactly what happened in the seventies. Every time we had a recession, the Fed got easier, and inflation was was uh, more deeply seeded into the economy, and and then finally it was Volcker who made the recession last. And we actually had two recessions under Volcker, right. uh, but he had, he had to make it long enough and deep enough 
to kill the inflation. And the longer you wait on that, by the way, the worse it has to be when you finally get around That's to that exactly policy. Right. And yep. I mean, one last thing here. You've got. Uh, we've only got about thirty seconds. We've had five straight quarters of uh, declining, or, you know, uh, literally declining real disposable personal income, which is which is the reason why it feels like a recession to so many people. Five straight quarters where real income has declined. Um, how is that impacting uh, people's investments, and what should they do? I know it's a complex question. Got about maybe twenty seconds to answer it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just. I, I mean, I first of all, I wouldn't argue that weird things aren't going on that people aren't hurting. It's a, it's a it's a strange time. But one of the reasons it's five straight quarters is because included in those incomes is all the checks from the government, right? And we stopped, and so that's what you know. That's confusing people. They don't know whether to go get a job or not. Well, Brian Westbury, you can find him on Twitter at Westbury, W-E-S-B-U-R-Y. So follow him there. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh Hewitt. We'll be right back. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Food for the Poor.
Portions of the following program may contain pre recorded material. Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. It's Hugh Hewitt. I am on my way back from Wyoming. I'll tell you about it tomorrow on the Thursday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. But Ed Morrissey is up from the great state of Texas sitting in today. He'll be able to fill you in on what he's been thinking and writing about over at Hot Air. And he's got quite a few thoughts. And I hope you've been reading Hot Air to see what he has been saying. Per usual, Ed is basically, I am mind melded with Ed and Ed is mind melded with me. It's the Catholic thing. Take it away, Ed Morrissey, and thank you. Thank you, Hugh Hewitt. This is Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh this morning from the ReliefFactor.com studios. Can't think of a better compliment, by the way, than to say that uh, I'm mind-melded to Hugh Hewitt, one of the smartest guys in radio and uh, certainly one of the nicest guys in life. And uh, great to be filling in for him. It's a great honor to be here with uh, Hugh Hewitt's uh, intensely smart audience and that's the reason why i like to bring on intensely smart people to discuss things that are going on joining me right now one of another one of my good friends jim garrity from national review uh who is also keeping a close eye on all of uh, the political developments of the day and of course jim today the big the big story is what happened in wyoming and what a great shock this wasn't (laughs) ed morning grace i'm kind of surprised that it took an entire you know, was it 30 minutes to if, announce that? that. Was, I think it was uh, uh, Decision Desk that uh, that initially called it and everybody else. I mean, we kind of knew the handwriting on the wall for this was a long while back. I think this was obvious really going back to the beginning of the year when it became clear Liz Cheney had taken this outspoken position, critical of Trump, and that she was not going to modify it. She was not going to downplay it. She was not going to focus on Wyoming issues, and you know, um, she had, she had, you know put out her flag. She drew a line in the sand. I think there's something very admirable about that when you say, "I don't care if my constituents feel differently. This is a matter of right and wrong, not right and left." And I'm going to I'm drawing my line in the sand. And if he's, if defeat is the consequence, I'll accept it. And somebody that's very admirable. Uh, Americans say they want somebody who isn't just going to be a weather vane and is going to be principled. Right up until the moment they actually get it, <laughs> they're usually like, "Well, I didn't mean it that way." <laughs> you know, no, no, no. I meant you should follow what, do what we want you to do on that issue. Um, what I was just talking about with Dwayne, though, and I'm kind of baffled by is I see a lot of people who are like, "Well, you know, she's defeated, but she's more powerful than ever." And I'm sitting there scratching my head, saying, "Really? Yeah. This this sets her up to be the next Mark Sanford or Joe Walsh or uh, Evan McMullen." Um, or Evan McMullen, very much, very much an Evan McMullen. If Evan McMullen had ever won office in the first place, I yeah. mean, I mean he was uh, de facto Democratic Senate candidate out in Utah. I keep hearing Democrats thinking he's going to win against Mike Lee. I'm very skeptical of that because it's Utah and it's a right. good year for Republicans. But I suppose stranger things have happened. Well, Jim, I mean, I think you're you're onto something here, but I want to I want to just step back a, a little bit into some of the things that you were saying because among the things that you were saying there, I think is really one of is really what created this wide gulf, and clearly it's a very wide gulf between uh, Liz Cheney and her constituents in Wyoming, which was not that she was. Uh, anti-Trump. There's other anti-Trump uh, Republicans who've managed to hang on to their offices, but it's the fact that she's really dedicated the entire um, session of Congress, this entire term in office, to investigating Trump and doing nothing else, and not doing any of the normal constituent service type thing. I mean, I'm sure that she answers her office answers emails from people who are having problems with, you know. Uh, you know, the bureaucracy and tries to help them struggle through that. I'm not talking about that type of personal constituent service, but I'm talking about focusing on issues that matter. And my friend Kelly Marr, I think you know Kelly. Oh, uh, uh, well, yes. Yeah, and she emailed me this morning, or late last night, because she was so frustrated over some of the commentary on this, and, and she said the difference in this race is that Harriet Hageman was going out into all the different places in Wyoming and talking about issues like land use, like water use, like inflation, um, you know, overregulation, the Biden administration's environmental policies, all these things that really detrimentally impact Wyoming voters and are very much on their mind in the present, while Liz Cheney is talking about what happened in the past and and nothing and exclusively that. And Wyoming only has one representative in the House, 
This is a statewide election because it's an at-large at seat. And I think that Hageman really understood that Wyoming voters were tired of having having no representation in the House, basically, for any of their concerns. If, if they had four other representatives, you know, like a, a, a smaller state like a Nevada or like a, um, or even like a Utah, where you could have three or four members, you know, pursuing those issues and you had one member doing, you know, going off on their own and, you know, um, uh, off to be alone in her principles and in, in, in the uh, from that great line from um, from that thing you do the movie that thing you do there he goes off to go write his new hit song I'm alone in my principles um, I mean I think that um, I think that voters might not have been so unhappy with Cheney but they're she's their only representative in the house and she's not representing them you know, if you look at a Brian Kemp the, the governor of Georgia who is looking pretty darn good in his odds against oh, yeah. Abrams in a re-election. Um, you know, the, the Kemp approach was, you know, Trump is mad at me, but I'm not mad at Trump. And let me tell you about what we're doing here in Georgia to protect the vote. Remember how Major League Baseball took away the All-Star game because allegedly we were suppressing the vote, and now look how big the vote is. Um, I'm just standing here for my conservative values. And, and you know, and, and Purdue got no traction against that. It was a you know, really surprisingly lopsided uh, response. I don't know if that exact scenario could have worked for Liz Cheney, but I think she very clearly decided. Uh, you know, for most people, it's like, look, you, oh, if you think I'm wrong on Trump, I'm sorry to hear that, but here's here's other issues that I work on on your behalf, and I hope you like them. And that worked very well for Brian Kemp. Also, I think the prospect of Governor Stacey Abrams uh, may have convinced <laughs> a whole bunch of Georgia Republicans to say, nah. We're not going to change horses in the middle of the stream. We don't, you know. And also, by the way, the other thing is that Trump at one point. Uh, made what might have been a semi-joking comment, but he kind of suggested that Stacey Abrams wouldn't be that bad. And I think that was a bridge too far for Georgia Republicans to even consider that, well, we're so mad at Brian Kemp for not, you know, uh, rigging the election for, for Trump or for not, you know, finding the 10,000 votes that, that Trump had demanded and all that kind of stuff. We're so mad at him, we're willing to accept Stacey Abrams. Trump may be willing to accept that, but the typical Georgia Republican is not. Right, um, and and so you know, if, if Liz Cheney had said, "Well, sorry, you disagree with me on Trump, but let me, you know, let me show you all these other," and the irony is, Liz Cheney has this ninety-some percent conservative voting record. They, they, right. by no stretch of the imagination can you genuinely argue she's a liberal, she's a progressive, she's a rhino sellout, et cetera, et cetera. That's one of the ironies of watching all of these Democrats to say, "Well, I never thought I'd, you know, be applauding someone named Cheney," but you know, and, and who's doing these sorts of things. The other thing that is very clear about this is how utterly transactional the praise of the left of center, you know, media voices and Democrats and things like that is, because, you know, let's say she had won the primary, and the moment she turned around and started making actual conservative arguments, people would go back to denouncing her as the blood spawn of the uh, <laughs> horrific, bloodthirsty warmonger, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, I, yeah. I, I, when I keep going back, you know, one of my favorite questions or, or sayings for, is from Ed is from uh, Stephen Covey saying, begin with the end in mind, right? You know, think right. about what your actual final objective is and kind of work backward from there about what you want to do. And I don't really get what Liz Cheney's goal is. I mean, I know she says she, she wants to stop Trump from being uh, elected again. And to me, the best way to do that is, all right, then you need somebody like a Ron DeSantis type to beat Trump in the Republican primary. Right. You need to have you know, the Republicans might be willing and ready to be a post-Trump party. They are not ready and willing to be an anti-Trump party. And this talk that she's going to run for president in 2024, uh, either in a you know, long shot primary challenge against Trump, again she turns into Joe Walsh, she turns into Mark Sanford, or this idea that she'll run for president as an independent, like that's just splitting the anti-Trump vote. What? I, I, right. None of that makes any sense. I'm kind of sitting there thinking. What, you know, what does she actually want to do here, unless the goal is just to be a really big star, uh, you know, beloved by MSNBC and CNN and places like that? And NBC, because she was on NBC yeah. this morning talking about, well, I might or might not. I'm not sure what I'm going to do about the presidential race. After, after uh, comparing herself to Lincoln and Grant uh, last night in her concession sp or semi-concession speech, I guess you could say, um, uh, her valediction, at least, and and so yeah, I mean, clearly that's she's aiming at that sort of thing. But once you've lost a statewide election in a state like Wyoming, it, I mean, you don't have a lot of credibility left. I got about thirty seconds left for you, Jim Garrity. Yeah, you know, you know. So let's let's say she does it. Let's say she doubles 
the William Weld vote from 2020. <laughs> right? like, you, you, like, you know, that's four percent. If she like, like I don't. You know, maybe she does a reasonable level in like uh, New Hampshire. And when I say a reasonable level, I mean like twenty percent, right? They, I, I just yeah. again, if you are a conservative who has not been anti-Trump like Ron DeSantis. But who also is saying, "Look, I'm the post-Trump. I give you all the policy stuff you want, and none of the circus." I think that works a heck of a lot better than anything Cheney's trying. I think you're absolutely right about that. Jim Garrity at Jim Garrity on Twitter. NationalReview.com is where you find his commentary. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com. We'll be right back. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show brought to you by Sierra Pacific Mortgage. For more info, call triple eight triple eight eleven seventy two.
Welcome back to Morning Fever here. Ed, I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh Hewitt. Man, I love disco bumpers. That's great stuff. That's great stuff. Coming to you uh, live from the ReliefFactor.com studio in Central Texas, uh, filling in for Hugh Hewitt today. And let's talk a little bit more about Food for the Poor and their great new um, effort in Ukraine. We've been telling you that thanks to donated food, every dollar donated provides four meals for hungry children who are refugees from the war in Ukraine. We've received many, many donations already, and you can join them by simply going to HughHewitt.com and clicking on the Help Ukraine banner. Some people have asked what kind of relief the Food for the Poor team and its ministry partners can deliver to active combat areas like Ukraine. This is Food for the Poor spokesman Todd Chapman. They're called mana packs, and they're uh, rice and beans and uh, protein uh, supplements with high nutritious. They're actually designed to provide healthy nutrition for malnourished kids. But we're packaging these up and sending them over in mass to Ukraine. And then we've got a distribution network of about 3,500 ministers of all different denominations. They're looking for these refugee families, usually moms and kids, and they're getting them this food because it's one of their greatest needs right now in, the, in, in Ukraine. So now it's your turn. Please, right now, go to HughHewitt.com and make a tax-deductible donation by clicking on the big Send Food banner on Hugh's website. Your one-time gift in any amount will bless a hungry child at HughHewitt.com. Or, if you prefer, you can call with your gift, 855-359-4673, 855-359-4673, that's 855-359-HOPE. To help our friends at the Christian nonprofit relief organization Food for the Poor, uh, great um, uh, is a great uh, effort going on there to help. Uh, regardless of what you think of the war in Ukraine, I happen to think that the Ukrainians are just uh, absolutely marvelously courageous in this moment in defending their homeland. You, different people have different perspectives on this, but the one thing that we can agree on is that this war is terrible for the people who are caught up in the crossfire. So, Food for the Poor is doing a great uh, is doing great work. Addressing that need, and again, you go to the uh, Help Ukraine banner uh, there, and you can uh, donate to Food for the Poor and help in that effort. Um, now, Dwayne and I are going to, you know, we've, we've spent all morning doing this. we still got another half hour left, because and we still got some great show left. But, you know, at the end of three hours, Dwayne and I go, you know, golly, I wish we could do this longer. And you know what? We can we because do. Tonight, we do because we're insane, Dwayne. <laughs> yes. Uh, so after this is over with and uh, we go home and recuperate, uh, this afternoon rolls around and you guys start prepping for the next day's worth of uh, broadcast. So there's going to be all sorts of new cuts and all sorts of crazy things said by all sorts of people. And I will kind of mine all that uh, data and all that uh, video. And uh, in the universe, H U G H N I V E R S E, that is uh, .com, that is Hughes' subscription site. Uh, I do a podcast four days a week, and on Wednesdays, when I am very fortunate, Ed Morrissey is my guest. So we get to kind of turn the tables around, and I get to lead the conversation. So uh, we will do that, and it's kind of a home and home show, right? You know, right? Because the next morning you do you're, you do my podcast. So so yeah, the next morning. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of. Uh, Ed and Dwayne over the next 24 hours. I mean, if if you if you haven't been sated with Ed, Eddie and Dwayne stuff at this point in time, well, we've got great news for you. Tune in tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern time, in the Universe, H U G H N I V E R S E dot com, the troll free web surfing experience for Hugh Hewitt fans and listeners. I have been a member for many many years, and I'm sure many of you are also members. And uh, and all the cuts that actually I left on the table today. <laughs> We're probably going to go through tonight, right? Yes, Blaine? and it, not only that, but we will also you will hear uh, all of the cuts that Hugh won't play tomorrow morning. There you go. So yes. that's a, that, that's 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 a draw right there. H u g h n i v e r s e dot com. The troll free web surfing experience for Hugh Hewitt fans and listeners. I'll be there tonight. Dwayne will be on my podcast, the Ed Morrissey Show podcast, which you can find at hotair dot com. Uh, there's a, a, a link in the um, at the top. There's also the other town hall. Uh, media podcasts and uh, my podcasts are also part of that 
There's links to all sorts of different platforms for that. You can get video at YouTube. You can get audio only at Spotify and Apple Podcasts. There's all sorts of fun stuff at hotter.com. Oh, my goodness. And there's more fun stuff coming, too. We'll talk about that maybe in a couple of weeks. I'm Ed Morrissey of hotair.com, filling in for Hugh. We'll be right back. The Hugh Hewitt Show is now available on TV. Go to SalemNewsChannel.com or download the app. You can also watch on Roku and Fire Stick. Salem News Channel, the antidote to the mainstream media.
Welcome back. This is Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com filling in for Hugh Hewitt today from the ReliefFactor.com studios in Central Texas. Joining me now is Professor Jonathan Adler, Case Western Reserve Law Professor, as well as contributor to Reason.com's Vola Conspiracy. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Hillary rule with, uh, with Jonathan. First off, welcome to the show. Thanks for, uh, thanks for jumping in here. Uh, great to be here. So the, the Hillary rule. We have esteemed attorneys on really the, the, the far ends of the of the trump spectrum right you got alan dershowitz who is basically been spending his 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 recent career uh defending or representing trump in a lot of different debates not you know and sometimes sometimes officially as he did in the um impeachment uh trial but uh and then you got david french who is very much against trump but both of them are saying the same thing uh jonathan which is that the Department of Justice has to follow its own precedent in dealing with any sort of um, issues regarding mishandling of, of classified information. And those precedents were set in 2016 by the FBI and the Department of Justice by default, actually, by letting James Comey uh, dictate policy, which is that there's all sorts of different conditions under which the Department of Justice won't move on any sorts of uh, allegations uh, what is your read of actually what the hillary rule actually is and how closely you expect merrick garland to abide by it well i mean my understanding of the hillary rule is actually two pieces one there's a different rule for high profile folks than there is for <laughs> oh, yeah you know, you know i mean as you're you may remember the case of, of christian saucier um the, yes. the uh, naval officer who was prosecuted um, for photos he took on a, on a submarine that uh, that he was stationed on, um, that because of what they were photos of contained national defense information covered by the Espionage Act, and and he was prosecuted, uh, even though it, it's pretty clear he was not engaged in any sort of espionage or skullduggery, um, uh, and he was not in, did not have the sort of uh, willfulness or or uh, uh, underhanded activity that that Comey says is required for. Uh, a high-profile person like Hillary Clinton. So, assuming that Trump is in the, you know, n not not the, uh, the 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 normal folk category, but in the high-profile category that Hillary was in, the requirement is something that that evidences bad faith, uh, that evidences a, an effort to obstruct uh, something more willful. I would note that there is some language in some of the relevant statutes that suggests that that should be the standard, at least for some of the potential offenses, and I, I hope and I think that the Justice Department will apply a similar standard um, if uh, before prosecuting. Um, I hope as well that the primary aim uh, of the warrant was to obtain and secure um, what is alleged to be a national defense information, which is covered by various statutes. Uh, and which is the sort of sensitive information um, that the federal government typically does not want uh, floating around out there and does not want in the hands of of former officials. Um, but, but, of course, we don't know. And we also, unfortunately, uh, have to take press reports about coming out of the FBI or the Department of Justice with a little bit of grain of salt because we, we've learned in recent years that that we may not be getting the whole picture. So um, I, I hope that they're going to apply a, a same standard, I think, as a political matter. Uh, and as you know, I am no Trump fan. I was on the opposite side of Alan Dershowitz on impeachment. Right. Um, but for political reasons, and, you know, and, for, and, and given the partisan divide in the country, I certainly hope the Justice Department is going to, to be consistent and and only take action if there is evidence of the sort of willful misconduct um, that uh, we did not see, or at least J James Comey did not see in the Hillary Clinton context. Well, it, 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 I mean, there's there was a lot to unpack in the Hillary Clinton context, too, because, uh, you know, if Trump took classified materials and stored them in an unsecured or, or, or insufficiently secured facility, that's definitely a violation of the Espionage Act statutes. I mean, I, I used to work in... Um, in a defense, really, well, it was a defense contractor, and I had security clearances for lower level classified material, and I know very well how that stuff is supposed to be secured, even at those levels. 
and I wasn't I wasn't dealing with top secret or, or compartmented information. So if that information existed, then there was a risk of exposure, and that's exactly right. what the Espionage Act is intended to prevent. But sure. there, but there's a couple of differences here, even in that. First off, what's being alleged is that Donald Trump took this stuff and stuck them in Mar-a-Lago in some sort of you know uh, storage unit at Mar-a-Lago to presumably so he could pour over them and do his memoirs at some point or just simply have them handy so that he had exclusive access to them. Um, Hillary Clinton transmitted them over a um, over an unsecured server uh, that made them very, very uh, susceptible to penetration by hostile forces and did it for four years. And the existence of that server was apparently, I mean, I think arguably and I, I think very arguably, uh, the, the use of that server was intended to uh, to give her an opportunity not to comply with the normal records processes at the State Department. Um, she was doing it to bypass those uh, checks and balances, and that makes that a little bit more of a malicious act. At, and at least that's that may not be an objective viewpoint, but certainly there is a lot more intent that uh, that one can argue when it comes to Hillary. So these well, cases yeah. are not necessarily even analogous yet. Yet. Well, yeah, I, mean, I, I share those concerns about the server. I mean, I, I do think that, that given uh, how conveniently so many things and records and the like were destroyed, um, whether or not proving um, what you and I both be- suspect were the reasons for having the server in the first place, I think it would have been hard to prove that in a prosecution beyond a reasonable doubt, although, um, you know, someone in her situation uh, should not have set something like that up by accident right. or um, uh, and the like. Here, you know, we don't really, the, the first reality is we don't know, right? We have what's been reported in the press. We, uh, how much confidence we have in that at this point. Right. No, we, we, we do have, we do have um, what's been released. We do know what statutes are cited. Um, you know, I think if I was going to play devil's advocate for, for Trump, I would say, you know, he believes, I think, that while as president, um, he can declassify whatever he wants, which is certainly true, although since it's information that's technically classified, not a document, right. you, you, can't, you can't just say, oh, well, because I have it, it's, a, it's declassified. Um, but I think he, you know, proving that he deliberately and knowingly was violating statutes would be hard up until the point, as alleged, that he was told to return information. And then the claim, of course, is that not all the information was returned. And if it could be proven that that it was deliberately not returned and perhaps that he was sharing some of this information, um, which, you know, maybe, because we we also have to wonder what made the FBI think that information hadn't been returned. Um, And presumably somebody, something gave them a heads up that the, the returns were incomplete. Um, and again, they need evidence that that was deliberate. Right. That wasn't just Trump's kind of cavalier attitude towards these sorts of considerations. Um, and I, you know, again, I, I, I want to have confidence that the Justice Department would not try and prosecute without an airtight case uh, against the former president, against one of his attorneys, against people that have worked for him on this. Um, but as you can tell, I, I don't have the degree of confidence that. I would like to have, um, given you know recent years and right. track record of, of of high profile political controversies like this. And again, we're speaking with Jonathan Adler, Case Western Reserve Law Professor, Volok, uh, Volok Conspiracy Contributor at Reason dot com at J Adler nineteen sixty nine. By the way, on Twitter at J Adler nineteen sixty nine. Um, Jonathan, this brings me, I think, to a broader point, right? Which is how much. How much trust and credibility does the FBI and the Department of Justice have after the last, you know, six or seven years of 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 leaks of 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 half cases being made public? I mean, this is part of the issue here. Is that uh, it? Almost seems like this is a needless escalation that all that damages a, uh, a credibility that's already damaged. And the response to the criticism of saying. You're fueling attacks. You should stop criticizing us because you're fueling uh, the threats that are coming to FBI offices and agents. I mean, that's almost a you know that's almost a um, 
it's 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 very strange. Uh, it's a very strange thing to hear from your government, right? Stop yeah. criticizing us because uh, you're you're on the side of the domestic terrorists. If you do, yes, I mean I think you know the FBI has has had several black eyes over the last several years, and there's not been a lot of evidence of people being held accountable for uh, missteps for. Um, allowing political views to influence investigations and the like. Um, And that means they don't have the credibility. And there are things like, you know, what happened with Trump's passport? Did they have him? Did they not have him? Which may have an innocent explanation, but that requires being a bit more forthcoming and and acknowledging um, when when missteps were made or when information wasn't communicated, not, as you note, criticizing the fact that people are criticizing you. That's not something that government opposition that government officials uh, should take. You know, I, I think at this point we don't know enough to know whether or not um, uh, the warrant was justified, although I suspect it was, and whether or not a prosecution would be justified. And there, I, I just don't know. I mean, again, m- the question that I want to know is, is after one tranche of, 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 of documents was returned, what made the Justice Department aware of the fact that not every relevant document had been returned. And that, I think, is key to, to understanding how, how justified these actions were. And, and who knows if we'll know that. Maybe the judge will release the affidavit later this week. Jonathan Adler, Case Western Reserve law professor, one of the smart commentators on these issues. Great to have him with us at jadler1969 on Twitter. Follow him there. I'm Ed Morrissey of hotair.com. We'll be right back. Hi, it's Hugh Hewitt. Don't go anywhere. Ed Morrissey is sitting in for me, but I do want to remind you that many of you are getting back into the housing market after a, uh, ah, we can't afford it, three-month pause. And that's good because the uh, Fed has gotten rates back to where they need to be to stop inflation. But so much money has come into the country that the 10 year is back below 3%. When I left Maine for Wyoming, it was at 2.88%. Andrew and Todd are back doing like box office business. The reason being, of course, is that many of you know you can't stay in a rental. You just cannot stay in a rental, especially moms and dads who have long ago bought their house, but now they've got 20-somethings and 30-somethings who are living in rentals and getting rent increased, whatever the lease allows. They know they got to get them out. Become a non-occupying co-borrower with your son or daughter, your grandson or your granddaughter. Your credit is great. Their credit is beginning to look good, but it's going to take them a few more years. You might add to the down payment, but you go on the deed with them. You go on the loan with them. Your credit helps their credit, and everybody wins, and they get out of the rental market. Go and call andrewandtodd.com at 888 There was Sierra Pacific Mortgage. They lend you the money, and if you're senior citizen, they're the ones to call if you need a reverse loan. That means you just get the cash out of your house, never make a mortgage payment again. But you start at 888-888-1172 or you go to andrewandtodd.com. Don't forget though, relieffactor.com. I don't want you to forget to take it. I took it with me to Wyoming. I take it for a reason. You know, people try and pull tricks on me, even when I'm interviewing future Congress people. Uh, Hey, have you got your relief factor with you? And I've always got it in my my sport coat and I take it everywhere I go because I don't want to miss a day and I don't want to fall behind. It's been uh, a week since I've been out on the hilly, rolly beach to beacon 10K, and I don't know if I'm going to have a chance to run in Wyoming. I don't know. Cattle are out there in the streets. I don't know. Uh, But ReliefFactor.com went with me anyway, and it ought to go with you wherever you go. 1995 is the starter pack. I hector you every day to remember to take it. ReliefFactor.com, 1995, the only place you can get it. ReliefFactor.com. Ed Morrissey, coming right back after this. Stay tuned. Don't forget to sign up in the universe for more Hugh, more Dwayne, that's me, the after show, and more. www.huniverse.com
I'm having a good time. I hope you are as well. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com, filling in for Hugh today. Hugh returns tomorrow, by the way, so he'll be back in the chair. But for right now, I've got the ReliefFactor.com studios here in Central Texas, and I've got control for one more segment here, and I want to go to a clip that really we've got to make sure we hit today. Yesterday, Joe Biden had a big uh, signing ceremony for the Inflation Reduction Act, which nobody now is saying reduces inflation. Uh, the Council of Economic Advisors Chair Cecilia Rouse appeared on CNN with Kate Boldwan right before the cer- right before this uh, signing ceremony, and uh, Kate Boldwan wanted to press her on what do you do with an Inflation Reduction Act that doesn't reduce inflation. Uh, here's the clip. Cecilia, Democrats titled this bill the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which begs, of course, for voters to hold you all accountable to that. The Congressional Budget Office, you know this, but to remind viewers, the Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan kind of scoring organization for um, legislation, says that the bill would have negligible impact on inflation this year and next. Are you personally comfortable as an economist calling it the Inflation Reduction Act? So this bill represents really important investments we know we need to make that help to expand our economic capacity. Inflation happens when we have too much demand for the supply, and we know we need to be uh, investing in the supply support so that we are better able as a country uh, to address issues like inflation going forward. So this will increase our economic growth, and because of how we plan to implement it and provisions in the bill, uh, it will, that growth will be more equitably shared. But if you passed a bill called the Fill Every Pothole Act, I mean, voters should expect you to fill every pothole. I mean, so should voters measure the success of this bill on how much you reduce inflation in the next couple of years? So this infl- this bill spins out over several years. And so the tax provisions, for example, some of the tax revenue will happen immediately. Some of the benefits in terms of deficit reduction t- will materialize over time. So again, it, this is really an, inf- uh, an investment in our economy. It represents the president's economic vision for transitioning to an economy that works better for American families by generating the kind of growth that's based on uh, stable, steady productivity gains in the language of economists. Uh, So that kind of growth that we know we need to be making in order to ensure that we continue progressing uh, for the decades to come. Yeah, and a name is just a name, but there are definitely a lot of other names you could have named this bill. Yeah, a name is just a name. They named it the Inflation Reduction Act. Did you, did everyone notice what Cecilia Rouse didn't claim was going to happen from the Inflation Reduction Act? She didn't claim that inflation was going to be reduced, not even over a long period of time, right? I mean, the the issue here is that Democrats have bet big. I mean, when I say bet big, I'm talking, you know, $700 billion worth of betting big. Uh, in in terms of calling this and labeling this their response to inflation. Why? Because inflation is the number one voter priority going into the midterms. And so they took what they had called Build Back Better initially and turned it into the Inflation Reduction Act so they could claim that they were acting on inflation. Now that the bill has passed, they're actually still describing this and they're, they're defending it as the Build Back Better plan, not as an Inflation Reduction Act. That's what Cecilia Rouse said yesterday, is that this is about Joe Biden's greater vision about, about transforming the American economy so it works better for American families. That was the Build Back Better argument, and that was the one that failed because Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, at the time at least, uh, realized that that type of transformative message in the middle of an economic morass was simply not going to sell with American voters. And now you're at a point where you've passed this bill, you've called it the Inflation Reduction Act, this is the number one issue coming into the midterms, and there are still two, count them, two cycles of inflation reports coming. And this bill is going to do nothing for um, for for tempering inflation, and the Federal Reserve isn't acting fast enough for that to be tempered in any significant way prior to the election. So that leaves you without a monetary policy that can help, leaves you without a, uh, a, a regular policy approach from the administration that can help. That means you're going to still see high inflation numbers, high inflation reports for the next two cycles. And voters are going to look at this and realize we've just been sold a bait and switch. Democrats passed this as an inflation response, and it actually has nothing to do with inflation. It has everything to do with just passing Joe Biden's and progressive Democrats' hobby horse agenda that they've been flogging for the past year and a half, and really that they've been flogging over the last two decades. 
It's a climate change bill. It's, uh, it's a uh, tax bill. It's an IRS expansion bill. They're going to add 87,000 employees to the IRS, more than doubling its size, so that they can do more audits on the American people while the House Democrats, at the same time, refuse to add, uh, refuse to spend money to expand police departments, local police departments, to fight crime. I mean, that's one heck of a message for the midterms. You know, we don't need more police. What we need is more IRS auditors. That's that's a that's a sales pitch that I think Republicans should focus on in the coming midterms. But Cecilia Rouse yesterday gave away the game. The White House is not going to stand by the Inflation Reduction Act as anything to do with inflation reduction. They're going to try to claim that, oh, it's going to do other things, greater things down the road. You don't need to worry about inflation. Inflation is, inflation is as Pramila Jayapal said last week, oh, that's just a theoretical term that economists use. Inflation, just like the 70s, is as omnipresent as disco is. Hey, man. Don't denigrate disco, Dwayne Patterson. We're going to talk about that on tonight's universe, by the way. More disco talk tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time. I'm Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com. Hugh comes back tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day.